Let's open up this morning in prayer. Father God, we just come before you and we bless your name. Father, so many gather to be blessed of God. But Father, we are a people that are called by your name and that we have come here this morning to bless you. You are Melech HaOlam, you are the king of the universe. We reverence ourselves before you this morning. We open our hearts up to your word this morning. We just ask that your spirit would make your words come alive in our hearing, that it would be burned into our consciousness, that it would be made alive into our souls, that we can live lives that would bring glory and honor to your name. Father, as darkness is moving in on every side, let your light, let your glory, let your way come upon your people and let them rise up in your ways, Lord. Let there be a line drawn in the sand that we do not follow after the ways of the world, but we follow after the ways, the statutes, the commandments, and the judgments of Almighty God. And Father, we thank you for it this morning in the holy name of Jesus. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want to go to Isaiah chapter 25. Isaiah is becoming extremely important, I believe, in the days of head. It seems like ever since Yom Teruah, the Holy Spirit has been speaking a lot of things here. How many know that the Feast of Trumpets is when announcements begin to be made from heaven so that we can hear, so that we can prepare for that which God is doing. And I, I think it's interesting that Sid Roth, in the middle of the fall feast, had Rabbi Jonathan Cohen on and began sharing the revelation that God gave him about that we are in the middle of the harbingers in America of God saying, judgment is coming. That actually began in 9-11. And the good rabbi began to bring out things that I never really took notice of on television, that we actually had politicians get up and quote the words of defiance recorded in Isaiah 9 and 10 into 9-11. It was, and it was on the very place that America was originally dedicated to God, the towers fell. I never heard that on the news, did you? Isaiah is becoming more and more important, just like the commandments of God for those that can hear, those that can see, are becoming important. And I want to show you, I think not only are the commandments becoming important, I believe that our attitude has got to be changed. I want to show you some things out of Isaiah chapter 25, and, and this is just the uh, introduction to some things that I have been pondering. We had a yeshiva with the, the men on Wednesday night, and the theme of it was the great falling away that the Apostle Paul was warning us about, and that word falling away deals with apostasia in the Greek, which we get the word apostasy from, and it literally means to defect away from truth. Just like if you were an American and you defected to Russia, it, it, it's switching back to another kingdom. That, we, that there is a movement right now in the church that is moving away from the truth of God's word. They don't want to hear the truth of God's word. Uh, Mary and I were talking this morning, and you know, listening to what we teach here is hard because we demand change. That the commandments are real. The statutes and judgments of God are real. While the whole world is doing something else, we're going back and we're doing that which God has commanded. Well, the whole world was getting ready for Halloween. We're celebrating the feasts because they're all about Messiah. And see, that that's hard to take because it requires change. But I see when even when Jesus was dealing with people and he would heal them, he would say, go and sin no more. Go and change lest something worse come on you. And somehow or another, we're preaching a gospel that doesn't include change. And so God's going to have to readjust some things. And uh, uh, as, as I want to preface this. Remember here a couple years ago we had the tsunami uh, in, in Asia? And there were a couple, of, even, even um, 
uh, main evangelical ministers have said, just possibly this could be the judgment of God because of what's going on, because there are more children trafficked trafficked out of that area for sex and different things than anywhere else in the world. And they said, well, very possibly God is judging something. And the liberal news media and many high officials in the church got up and said, that wasn't God because I would never serve a God who would judge. Boy, that, that just stuck out to me. Because, because I actually read the word. <laughs> I read the word. Look here, what in Isaiah 25, what first comes out of the prophet's mouth here. O Lord, thou art my God. I will exalt thee, I will praise thy name, for thou hast done wonderful things. Doesn't that sound good? Thou hast done wonderful things? But let's get ready to read the wonderful things that he did because we, well, you know, you know, gold dust has fallen from heaven and all these different things, you know. I don't know. Maybe I, I do have enough uh, Hebrew in me that uh, until it starts folding gold bricks, I'm not interested, you know. <laughs> all these crazy, th I, I, you never see that in the Word. So what wonderful things are God doing? Thy counsels of old are faithful and true. Thou hast made a city a heap of a defense city, a ruin, a place of strangers to no city. It shall never be built. Well, I just, brother, I just don't see no wonderful there. The prophet is praising God for God judging sin. Somehow or another, and we're, we're going to begin seeing this from Scripture this morning, that we have been preached another gospel. You can't preach Jesus without Moses. Isn't that what we find in the book of Revelation? They sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. You can't really even understand Messiah unless you understand Moses. Jesus stood before the Jewish people and said, you wouldn't hear Moses, so you won't hear me. So let me put before you that you never really hear Jesus until you hear Moses. That's why one of the things I pray for Israel every day is that there would be a revival of Moses. Not, not, the, not the traditions of necessarily of the rabbis. Now, we talk about the Talmud and how there are some things good in it and there are some things bad in it. The same way I can point to any evangelical commentary I've got sitting back there on the shelf and I can say the same thing because it's the opinion of men. They need to return to Moses. Guess what? So do we. Because only until you return to the commandments, statutes, and judgments of God can you really find the real Jesus. And we have people today that when God begins to judge, they're going to get offended at God. But you know what? I believe a real praise to God is going to begin released from the remnant, from those that are faithful to God, that have returned to his ways and say, I understand. His grace is released to me when his judgment is released upon sin. We find that at the cross, don't we? That the wrath of God had to be poured out on Messiah at the cross so that his grace could be poured out on me. You can't have one without the other. It was Yahweh Elohim that created the heavens and the earth. Yahweh represents the grace, the chesed of God. Elohim represents the justice of God. God had to balance grace and justice when he created the world. And let me tell you something, for the world ever to be in balance, those things have to be in balance. When you go too far one way or the other, things are out of balance. And we have, we have had an extended period in, the, in, in what some people call the church age, because we have had an, we have had 90% grace and 10% justice and we didn't realize that was a test to see how faithful we would stay to God because there were no instant consequences. You know, if, if, if somebody went out here and said something against God or did something wrong and lightning struck them and, and burnt them to a crispy critter, how many know that it wouldn't be very long nobody would do that? But the testing comes when there's no immediate consequence. That's why the Bible says don't, 
saints, don't get aggravated when it seems like sin isn't being punished and it seems like wickedness is getting rich and all these things because it, it's separating the man from the boys. It's separating those who love God and his commandments to those that have created for themselves an idol. And an idol is basically you create a God in the image that you want instead of accepting God as he is. Let's try to get on just a little bit further here in Isaiah, shall we? Oh. Verse 3, therefore shall the strong people glorify thee, and the people of terrible nations shall fear thee. Thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat when the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. Now, can you see the dichotomy here? As God judges evil, those that are walking with him that have grown weary from the darkness get strength. Come on now. We need to understand there is a refreshing coming, there is a strength coming from the Almighty, but it's going to be released at the same time as we see him beginning to take care of some things in the earth. His name is not reverenced anymore. It, the only time that you can ever use it on television, unless a Christian or, or somebody pays for that time, it can be used as a curse, but it can no longer be used in prayer. We have chaplains being told they can't even pray in the name of Jesus anymore. They just said in, in the name of God. Well, there, there are so many false gods. And so you kind of wonder who they're praying to. Verse 5, and thou shalt bring down the noise of strangers as the heat in a dry place, even the heat with a, a shadow of a cloud. Uh, the branch of the terrible one shall bow low, and this, and this, uh, and in this mountain God, uh, shall the the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wine of the leaves, the fat things made of marrow of uh, of the face of the covering, uh, and he. I'm fighting new glasses this morning. Just give me a second. I got to find the right place here. Bifo trifocals are not fun. Of uh, fat things of the marrow and of wine of leaves uh, will refine, and he will destroy in this mountain the face of the, of the covering cast over the people and the veil that is spread over all nations. How many know there's a veil coming on the nations right now? There's a darkness coming on the nations now. And it's a blending of socialism, Islam, and the Illuminati or Luciferianism. It's a blending. But how many know for those that walk with God, it won't be able to cover there? He shall swallow up death in victory, and the Lord shall wipe away uh, tears from off all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from all, all the earth, for the Lord has spoken it. Now, the prophet considers judgment against evil a wonderful thing. That's not politically correct. If you're trying to be politically correct, the devil's controlling your life. You better go back and be correct by this book. All of it from Genesis to Revelation. You better line up with it if you're going to really say that you serve the Jesus of the Bible. It better line up with the book. You know, it's amazing to me that the Apostle Paul, dealing in Colossia, the Shammai Pharisees simply, and, the, and you, you, you find the, the whole argument uh, in Acts that they said salvation to the Gentiles comes by circumcision. He said it's in faith in Messiah. And simply by br embracing that one concept, and that's really the only thing of the Torah that we actually see God placed in the Torah after they received circumcision in the flesh at Mount Sinai. They built a golden calf and everything. God said, oh, I wish I'd have circumcised their hearts. So that's really what he was after. That just that one thing, the Apostle Paul says, who bewitched you that you believe another gospel? I think he would be saying the same thing to the church today. Who has bewitched you that you have believed a gospel, that you have separated the commandments, statutes, and judgments of God and the feasts of God from the service to God that came by Messiah? Who bewitched you? And we've also got to add, are they, are they serving another Christ? 
if there is a Jesus that is against the law, which Jesus is that? How many know Jesus was, was not antinomian? Antinomia, when he said, when people come and they say, Lord, Lord, have I not done this in your name, that in your name? And he said, I never knew you. Get thee, get thee away from me, ye workers of iniquity. That word iniquity in the Greek is antinomia, which means he who stands against the law of God. So there's going to be a lot of people that, that know the name Jesus. They never knew the real Jesus behind the name. And so we, we've, got, we've got to, guys, we've got to get back to the book. Now, one of the things we read last week that, that really stood out to me, let's go to Isaiah 35. I just, I wanted to introduce that to you this morning. Of, we're going to have to change our attitude be, about God judging things because it's also reflected in Revelation 19. Revelation 19 is a post-Calvary view of the exact same thing that Isaiah just showed us before Calvary. How many know it's the same attitude? When God is judging the world, he, he has destroyed Babylon, and the saints say, you're awesome, you're great in your judgments, you're holy in all that you do. Same thing, isn't it? Well, if it was that way before the cross and is that way after the cross, maybe it should be that way now. Just, just a thought. Go back and, and read Revelation 19, verses 1 through 6, and look at the placement of it and see if it, it doesn't mirror Isaiah 25. It's the exact same event. You had two different prophets seeing the same event. But the thing this week that, that kept coming up to me is, as, as I would pray and I would seek God, we, we touched on it a little bit last week in Isaiah 35 and 8, and it says, and and highway shall be there a way, and it shall be called the way of what? Holiness. holiness. The way of holiness, the unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, uh, the, uh, the wayfaring men, though fools shall not err therein. Now, when, you begin to, when I begin to read this and study this out, uh, how many know that this, the, Prophecy, there can be more than one interpretation for prophecy. Just like the Torah, there are four levels of interpretation in parodies when you look at the way the rabbis interpret. And there, there's line upon line, but there's also precept upon precept that God is teaching us precepts in the word. And let me tell you something, the Gentile church, we understand line upon line, but we're blind as a bat to precepts. We, we don't... We, we don't get the stories. Why did, God, why did God go to all this length to share some of these things? He's teaching us principles. And there's a principle here. Now, Dake brought out, yeah, one of, in, in Bible prophecy, there's going to be a place made where those that were hiding in the desert, as they make their way to Mount Zion, God is going to create a safe path for them. But let me put before you, we're all on a journey toward Mount Zion. And the way to get there safely is called the highway of holiness, and no sin walks on it. When you, when you look at the Hebrew, derech means it is a road, it is a, it is a way, a distance, a journey, a course of life, of moral character. So it's not just talking about a literal road. It's talking about there's a journey there that I go from point A to point B. B, and point B being Mount Zion. As I go there, that this, this, is, this is a journey. It is also, of course, of life. That there's a, there, you have to be a certain way before you can get on the road. Does that make sense? I've got to walk because of what Messiah has done in me. I am finally being able to take care of the sin nature, and I'm now walking in that new nature that Messiah had, and it's walking in the statutes, the commandments, and judgments of God, because as the Apostle Paul said, if I'm really loving him and my motivation is love, I can fulfill the commandments the way they were meant to be filled, out of love. That's why the watchword of Israel, Smite Israel, Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Had. Hear, O Lord our God, the Lord is one, and I will love the Lord my God with all my strength, with all my soul, with all my might. Because out of that love, I conform myself 
to the commandments, statutes, and judgments of God. Out of love, Jesus said it another way, if you love me, keep my commandments. Because when I do that, I am able to begin walking on the highway of holiness. And it's not as we supposed. I, I, I remember as a young Baptist boy, before I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, we had a lot of what we call the old line holiness. And old line holiness was basically you couldn't wear jewelry. Women couldn't wear makeup. And you know, I'm, I'm all for wear, women wearing makeup. And, and the, the difference between a righteous woman wearing makeup and Jezebel are not only in inches of thickness, but when you read it in the Hebrew, she put on a war paint face. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm, not all, I'm not for anybody putting on a war paint face, but, there's, but I'm, I'm also for things like deodorant, which some of the old holiness movement didn't believe in that either. Holiness is walking in the statutes, the commandments, and the judgments of God and crucifying the flesh so that I make my flesh do what God said to do when my flesh doesn't want to do it and the Holy Spirit is here to help me in that walk to do that. There's a, there's a highway to holiness. Now the holiness here in Hebrew is, is kodesh, which means apartness, holiness, sacredness, separate. Uh, separatedness, apartness. Sometimes we don't realize that when, when God is kadosh, 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 the most literal interpretation of that holiness is he is completely other. Everything that you can see on this world, the world, the world is thriving with this, God is the absolute opposite of it. He is the ultimate other. And as I come in line with him, I become separated unto that otherness. And that is the, the roadway, the pathway, the journey that I'm supposed to walk. Because somehow or another, we have lost the journey. We're into events now. Everything's Hollywood. We're into events. We go from one conference to another. You know, one of the things that Mary and I were talking about, if God actually did start pouring out his power and people started getting healed, sinners couldn't get in there because the saints would eat them for lunch because they're in their way to be entertained by something. Because I've been to some of those. They're there two hours beforehand just because they might see something. Signs and wonders are supposed to follow after us. Why are we chasing after them? Maybe because we're not on the highway. You see, I, th I think that we position ourselves for the blessings of God and the miracles of God when we're walking in his ways because we're strategically in the right place at the right time doing the right thing, and we have sowed the right seed. The modern church is all about events, but God's word says just the opposite. It's all about the journey, the halakha, the walk with God. God called Abram, come walk with me, and I will make you. Oh, I, I love the Hebrew there. We've, we've shared this many times where God said, come walk, uh, come, come walk before me and be thou perfect. And we think that means God said, come, you better, now that you're walking with me, boy, you better straighten up, fly right. And what he literally said was, as you walk with me, I'll make you into what you can be. That's how he moved from Abram to Abraham. And did not Jesus say the same thing when he said, come follow me and I'll make you? You'll end up being fishers of men because what I make you is going to be so alluring to those that are spiritually hungry. But if there's no journey on the road, there's no making. That's why we have saints that are in the way for 50 years. That they're basically the same they were the day they made Jesus the Lord and Savior of life because they're never taught the path to walk in. They go from event to event to event, not realizing that everything between the event, they're walking in the way that's going to be judged instead of the way of God that's going to be blessed. Well, you know, you're, you're preaching Old Testament. Well, so did the Apostle Paul, but let's, let's just overlook that just for a minute, okay? Ever, did you ever think the Apostle Paul taught was Old Testament? 
I, ne- I, never, I never read once in the book of Acts where he said, today I'm going to be preaching from my first letter to the Romans. He preached from Moses. He preached from the prophets. But ju- just in case you have a problem with that, I, I want to go to Matthew chapter 7. Let's get a little New Testament because one of the things that you see throughout all of the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation is the path to walk in. Over and over again, we have this highway of holiness that Isaiah talks about, which was defined by Moses. And you know that Moses only actually really wrote one book. The first four, he was God's secretary. He just simply wrote it down. And he was so worried that you would forget what God dictated to him. Moses wrote Deuteronomy. The others he didn't write. He, he did not author, if you will. It was Almighty God. Jesus sat down and said, Moses, grab a pen. I've got some things I want to share with you. This, this is how you... And guys, it's the antidote to Egypt. It's the antidote to Babylon. If it was the antidote to Babylon for the Hebrew people at Mount Sinai, it's the antidote for Babylon in this world today. This is how, because you've been so in the world and so confused, let me, let me tell you, this is clean, this is unclean, this is holy, this is unholy. Now, embrace the holy so that I can walk with you. That's the same call for the saints today. But I, I want you to notice what Jesus said here, because see if it doesn't sound the same. Ye enter in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to the next church convention. No, destruction. And many there be that go thereat. One of the, and I, I was brainstorming with Mary this morning. I was trying to remember who said this. And sometimes you know, I listen to so much and read so much, I always can't remember where I heard it from, but you always want to try to give credit. That I heard one minister one time say that the problem with the church is they have more faith in a 30-second prayer than they do in the Word of God. Because we have reduced the gospel to a 30-second prayer that gives you a Willy Wonka golden ticket. And then you can live any way that you want to. You can act any way you want to. You can say stuff is of God when it's not, and you can say stuff is of the devil when it's actually of God, and you still get to heaven. Guys, there, there is a hyper-grace movement. It, it, it is, it, it's stupidity on steroids. And it, it, it goes hand-in-hand hand with liberalism. That there are ministers that teach, once you accept Jesus, you can do anything you want to do. You can live any way you want to live because it doesn't matter because we're under grace. Jesus said, and wide is that road that leads to destruction. Wide is that road. You can do anything you want to. Just go ahead. It's okay. We're all under grace. No, 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 no. Grace is God's divine ability not to sin, not to get away with it. But look what Jesus says, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads unto life and few be there that find it. But I had never noticed, you know, we're we're so guilty of taking sound bites out of the Bible. And eventually God opened your eyes. And just because my study Bible says Jesus just changed topics and it's the next verse, he's still preaching the same message. Here's the scary part, guys. Jesus is saying, wide is the way that everybody can walk in, that everybody wants to go, and it leads to death. And narrow is the way that I'm giving you that leads to life. Now beware of false prophets. So in the context, the false prophets are in context with which gate and which path you walk on. Can can you guys see that there? Okay, it's, it's, I've, I've not drank too much decaf this morning and didn't have enough caffeine to see the truth, so you guys are getting this. Jesus is saying, the, so we, we need to realize, and this is uniform, in whether we're, we're talking Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation, the real test of a prophet or a teacher of the word. Now, everybody remembers, you know, well, you know, if a prophet says something that doesn't come to pass, he's a false prophet. 
Well, how about if it doesn't come to pass in his lifetime? Otherwise, Isaiah would have been a false prophet. I mean, he spoke things way into the future, didn't he? We're, we're still beginning now to walk in things, and some of the things he spoke aren't going to happen until the end of the book. So there, so there has to be a little bit more than that. They forget that in the same breath, uh, Moses said, if everything he says comes to path, but pass, but if he tells you, let's go and serve other gods. Well, how did you delineate how that they serve their gods and how that we serve our God? Because Baal kind of also means Lord. So I can be saying, I'm following the Lord, and you're saying, I'm following the Lord. How do we differentiate by which Lord you're serving and which Lord I'm serving? By the path you walk in. Uh-oh. By the path you walk in. Oh. Because in Matthew 25, Jesus said, and answered them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and shall deceive many. And we think that's other people saying that they're the Christ and not him, but that's not what he said. He said, many will say that I am Jesus, the Christ, and, they'll and they will deceive many because they're actually preaching another Jesus. If by Galatians the Apostle Paul said people were preaching another Jesus, then let me tell you something, 2,000 years later, people are preaching another Jesus. And I don't care if they say Jesus or Yeshua, they say Jesus the Christ or Yeshua HaMashiach, you better look at the path they're putting you on and what they're presenting to you. Because, uh, guys, I'm, I'm in a quandary. I, 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 think, I think that part of my calling in the body is to get the church saved. To, to get the church saved because they, they, they are the, oh, they are the gathered together, the gathering together in Jesus' name. It's just a different Jesus they're serving. And when you actually start presenting the truth of God to them, they look at it like it's a strange thing. Oh, why are you doing celebrating the feast? Well, they're all about Jesus. Huh? If I had a dollar for every huh that I've been given, I could go ahead and, and buy land and build a church and not bar borrow money from the bank. If huhs were gold, we don't know. Why? Because we were presented another Jesus. We were presented a Roman Catholic Jesus, a Babylonian Jesus. Wearing Babylonian garments and having Babylonian gold and silver in his pockets. This, that'll hit you here in a little bit. It's the path. If we go back and look at the definition of a false prophet, if he says, go over and follow other gods, in other words, he leads you on another path, he's a false prophet. And by teaching, and this goes back to Marcion, that Jesus conquered the Torah, you just went on another path. Which to the Jewish people, you just made Jesus a false messiah. Do you know that? Because God says, I allow false prophets to come among you. I allow them to do f real signs and wonders among you because I'm testing you. Because when it comes down to the court of God, God has got to actually provide evidence, not foreknowledge, but evidence of what you are really going to do. Why is that so significant? Because when you understand Islamic eschatological teaching, and how many know that with the rise of the Antichrist, Islam and liberalism and all those things are going to be wove right into it? Islam teaches that when the Mahdi comes, what we, which we call the Antichrist, that Jesus will come with him doing signs and wonders and healing the sick and raising the dead. But if you don't confess that Muhammad is the prophet and that Allah is God and start walking in that way, that that Jesus will have you executed. 
So you better know which Jesus you're serving. You see, the, the devil doesn't want you to understand that the path that you're on is a dark path. He doesn't give you full disclosure. But let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 30, and I want to I show you something here. You know, I've, I've got a lot of people that we hear from the Internet and the students that we have, and, and uh, I've got kind of a love-hate relationship with them. Because they, they, they sense in the anointing of the Holy Spirit that there's something about what I'm saying, but yet it's a hard thing. What do you mean God wants me to change? Yes. If I was, if I was delivered from the kingdom of darkness, how about not taking, you know, this is something about Christians. You can take any piece of junk and put the name of Jesus on it and pay three times what it's worth at the Christian bookstore. Stuff the world doesn't want. Oh, we don't do that. Did you know back in the 80s, psychology, psychologists, the entire counseling community said psychology does not work and it's defunct. About that time, the church quit fighting secular psychology and started to embracing it and it was resurrected by the church. Because we could put biblical secular psychology And you look at that, and it's diametrically opposed to being answerable to God. How I many know oh, God always gives you more than the tools to cope? He gives you the tools to overcome. Overcoming is a whole lot different than coping. It's like, you know, having a mad badger in your pocket that's biting you and clawing you all the time, and they give you the skills to cope with it so that you can heal up your wounds and keep it happy most of the time. God gives you the ability to cut the badger's head off and throw it out of your pocket and then to get healed up and then you have a, you have a ministry of casting badgers out of people's lives. Oh, I, I want to show you just how good God is. Starting in verse 15 of Deuteronomy, see I have set before thee this day life and good death and evil I have set before you that which is clean I have now defined what is unclean the apostle John is still preaching to the church today he is saying the violation of the Torah is still sin long after the cross hmm and if someone says, I know God, and still is doing the violation of the Torah, he don't even know God. He's a liar. Why? He's following the wrong Jesus. Torah defines good and evil. Torah defines this is sin, this is not. Torah defines these are the paths to walk in, these are the paths to avoid like the plague. Because when you get on that path, it's gonna, you're going to end up in hell. It's going to bring death and destruction to your life. You end up on this path of holiness. It may be a straight-laced path. It may not let you do all the fun things, the fun things everybody else is doing, but you're doing the things of God, but you always end up in Zion. My problem has been that as I'm walking down it, these angels keep on handing me nails and a hammer. And I'm thinking, the Lord is calling me to build. When heaven is calling me to crucify. <laughs> Selah. You can't make friends with the devil. You can't make friends with the sin nature. You got to crucify it. The, the, the Holy Spirit puts a big bullseye here and says, place nail here, hit repeatedly with a hammer until it don't move no more. Oh. 
See, I have set before thee this day life and good, death and evil. Now, this is after basically the Torah has been completed, all except the writings. And Moses had such anointing on Deuteronomy that he wrote at the end. Have you, have you ever read the end of Deuteronomy? Okay, he's writing it, and Moses is saying, and then I'm going to go up, and God is going to take my life, and then they're going to come down. He's actually writing what's going to happen after he dies. <laughs> How many know that may, be, that may be a clue that you're at your last chapter? <laughs> but he had spent so much time with God that he could see into that which was going to come, and he didn't have any problems with it. After he, you know, after he said, Lord, I've just begun to see your glory. I'm just 120. And I kind of wonder if, if Moses' mind, it's like, not only have I begun to, to see your glory, who's going to corral all these people? Because you know what happens the moment I turn my back? But at the time this was spoken, the first four books were completed, and now he's in the process, and he's, he's saying, listen, I have already taught you the first four books. I've already, I've already taught you the ways of God, and this is, this is Devrim. This, this is my words of, of trying to encapsulate that which I gave in the first four books that God gave through me because I want you to get it because God, see, God has set before you life and death. That means life and death was fully embodied and fully defined in the first four books. And when you use the principle of first mention, that means they never deviate from that. That's God setting the stage. That's God giving the definitions. And once God gives the definitions, he don't care about yours. He doesn't care. Just like on my computer, and I've shared this before, I can have, I can have an icon with a big W that means Microsoft Word. You know, I can rename that Angry Birds. And I go around saying, I got angry birds on my computer. Yeah, I got them. Watch this. What comes up? Word. <laughs> because you can call it anything you want, but it's the origin of anything is where its spiritual power is. And if you can trace it back to Rome and you can trace it on back into Egypt and Babylon, you know the origin of it. And so when you press that icon by your doing, you know what's going to be released. But when I go back into God's word, into the foundation, and God has clearly set life there, I, it, it doesn't matter if you call it uh, misvaot or if you call it commandments, you call it by the Hebrew, you call it by the English, or if we were in, in Mexico, we call it by the Spanish. It doesn't matter because when I do it, it releases heaven. And that's where Messiah brought me to be able to do it. Because God has clearly set before me life and death in that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God. It also, that's what the Apostle Paul was trying to accentuate is that it's got to be by love for God. I can do it by religious spirit and it brings death to me because I'm trying to earn his love. But when I find out that God has loved me when I was unlovable and Messiah came and gave his life for me, my response out of love is what follows next. That my love is manifested not by me just lifting my hands in a church service and saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. And when you leave the church, that your, your life is saying, I don't care about you, I don't care about you, I don't care about you. See you next week. He says, here's how you show your love. To walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that. Underline that in your Bible. That's causative. If you do this, you get that. I know this is deep. If you do this, you get this. It's like telling your kids if you clean up your room, you're going to get a prize at Walmart. And how many know as a parent you get very upset when they went in there and made the room worse than what it was to begin with, and they're still expecting that trip to Walmart? Behold the church. And so we'll begin following after any Jesus that allows us to make the mess and still get some kind of pseudo blessing. So much so that we talk more about Mammon than we do Jesus. <laughs> Come on. 
You see, you can get the blessing of God if you do what God says. If you work the word, the word will work. But a lot of people that even teach that start with the book of Matthew. How about starting with God's first book? Go back to the beginning. If you do what God says, you'll get the blessing, and it takes time for it to begin to set into place. The whole church is about instantaneous. God is about the journey. He said if you get what yeah, I am going to say this. The whole kingdom of God operates on some principles. One of them are law. It's a court of law. God's kingdom is a court of law. He is El Gabor. He is the great and mighty judge. So everything has to operate by law. That's why in the New Testament, the adversary, that word means a prosecuting attorney. The whole time he gets us to violate God's law, he then stands in God's face and says, I have a legal right to attack them because they're violating your law. But the moment that we start keeping the law and start crying out to God for justice, he's the one who gets thrown out in the book of Revelation. Because that, where it talks about that they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by their testimony. That word testimony in the Greek means to give a testimony before a judge. Not my sharing with you what Jesus has done, but my giving testimony to the court of God. I'm walking in your ways. I'm honoring you. Look what the devil's doing. And finally the father says, get that joker out of my court. And the Bible says, well, now he's coming down to earth with wrath because he knows his time's short. Let's shorten his time. It's the blood of the lamb, the keeping of the, of, of the commandments, and then we can give testimony that, Father, look what he's doing in the earth, and I'm keeping your ways. I'm keeping your ways because of the blood of Jesus. I'm keeping your ways because I'm walking in his name. I'm walking just like Jesus walked. What would Jesus do? Jesus would keep the commandments. I never see once where Jesus celebrated Easter or Christmas. Come on now. You know it's my birthday. Everybody give gifts to one another because I just want to celebrate. Woohoo, it's my birthday. Took us 300 years to get that joker in there. Actually, more than 300. He celebrated the feast because he could sit in the middle of whether it's the Day of Atonement or the Passover and he could explain his mission and who he was. But God says, if you walk in my ways, my commandments, my statutes, and my judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply, and that the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land, whether thou goest to possess it. Well, brother, that's just about Israel. It's also about America. There are only two nations on the planet that dedicated themselves to God at their founding. That's why America, real America, not some of the jokers we see in Washington, D.C., real America says we stand with Israel. That's why any time our leaders in, in Washington, D.C. have ever made a move against Israel, disaster has struck America because we're in covenant. And there was a land that we're supposed to possess. And let me tell you something, if true Christians were supposed to possess America, the Illuminati need to pack their bags and go back to Europe. Progressives need to pack. You want to be a socialist? Move to Russia. Communist China will make room for you. But God has a destiny for this land. In fact, the original, not, not the founding fathers, I'm talking about those who actually first made it over, they wanted to call this the new Israel. Even our founding fathers wanted to give the, and, and it's interesting because it's what we call the Bible Belt now. That was the original land they were going to give to the Jewish people for them to have a new Israel because they said the Jewish people need a land. And then a couple of them broke open the book and said, well, you know, when you, when you read about the... Uh, 
the things in Ezekiel about the dry bones, maybe God's going to actually give them back that land. Let's not stand in the way of God who's actually given us this nation. So let's just let God handle that. We just want to make sure that the Jewish people are welcomed here. And they are until you get around progressives and liberals. There's, there, there, I'm, I'm hearing new terms in America. Beware of the Google Jews. You mean you're having Jewish people Google you? <laughs> We're having anti-Semitism now taught by those that have rejected God in our universities. The media is turning a blind eye to it. Guys, there, 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 is a, there is a line in the sand being drawn in America right now. Which side of it are you on? Are you on the side of life? Or are you on the side of death? Because God's getting ready to judge some death. I believe with all my heart, this, this is my passion, guys. I really don't see America in Bible prophecy. And I want it that way because we didn't become a part of the Antichrist system. Because we find out when Jesus comes back that he's going to separate the goat from the sheep. I, I want most of America to be going, ah, when Jesus shows up. Not, nah. And everything that I can see in the book of Revelation deals with the Middle East. It deals with Europe. But that can only happen if those who are called by his name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways that they were following another Jesus. They were following other ways than that of God. Well, brother, I'm going to need some more New Testament on this. Well, the Apostle Paul is on my side. Let's look and see what he said in Colossians chapter 2. How many know the Apostle Paul never abandoned Torah? He had the challenge of teaching Gentiles Torah with delineating between that which is a native-born Jew, because there are some things that the Bible distinctly says, this is the law, if you're living in Israel, you have to live in a Torah-based community, and then the things that are for everybody. I mean, e even with tabernacles. This year, we built a sukkah, but I didn't sleep in it overnight. Because the Bible says you have to be a native-born Israelite. I'm making it becomes a prayer place. But sometimes, and so the Apostle Paul had kind of, and it's interesting, he put, the Apostle Paul talks about the feast in 1 Corinthians, but he never talked about a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Because there was maybe a way that he was modifying the feast. Could you imagine if three times as many Gentiles showed up to Jerusalem as the Jews? How I many of that might just cause a little bit of problem? And all their talit said, made by Rabbi Shaul. <laughs> maybe, maybe it would have caused just a little bit of a problem. So he had to balance out some things, and he leaned heavily on the way that the school of Hillel saw things of the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law. So it's the school of Shammai versus the school of Hillel. But let's, let's see what he says here now. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. So he's, he's talking about people getting, getting off a little bit here in verse 4. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus our Lord, so walk ye in him. So walk ye in him. Is there anything today that the mainline church is teaching you to walk in? And is it him? This may be hard, but what, what separates false teachers from real teachers is not who they say Jesus is. It's the path they set you in. I'm going to get some flack from this. You know what? Flack away. Because that's what God says. It's the path they set you in. Look at the life of Jesus. 
Jesus was Torah observant, and I guarantee you Jesus never went to anybody's house on a Saturday afternoon for a ham sandwich. Jesus didn't even consider pigs food. He was all worried about bread and fish, none of it going to, you know, look at all these hungry people. Can you imagine? Jesus didn't say, when the, when the pigs went over the cliff at, with the madman of Gadara, oh, look at all that bacon we just lost. He didn't consider it food. Yeah, we think that doesn't matter. Well, it doesn't matter to a Babylonian Jesus. It doesn't matter to a, a uh, Roman Catholic Jesus. But it matters to the Jewish Jesus. He never celebrated one pagan holiday. He kept to the feast because it was on the feast days when they were pouring out the libation offering on the, on the altar and, and everybody would be quiet and they'd, they'd hear the hiss of the water hitting that hot altar. And then in the midst of that, he says, if any man thirst, let him come to me. And boy, you, you see the oh, Messiah just interpreted what this is. He couldn't have done that on candle mass. <laughs> he couldn't have done that on Easter. He couldn't have done that. They're about him. If you, if you understand everything that Jesus wouldn't do, it becomes very clear what Jesus would do. And Paul says, listen, I presented to you a Jewish Messiah, Gentile church. I presented one to you that I have proven from Moses and the prophets that he is Messiah and that he is coming to redeem all mankind. It is that Jesus that I have showed to you. Now you walk in him. Because there's all these nasty Gnostics that are coming out of the woodwork in Greco-Roman mentality and vain philosophies that are trying to present another Jesus to you. That isn't the Jesus that I preached. Don't walk in that. Walk in this. Rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy. Greek Roman mentality, philosophy. Philosophy, by definition, is the study and love of Sophia, which was a Greek goddess. That there is a worldly wisdom that is opposed to godly wisdom. James said in the book of James, there is a wisdom that is dark and there's a wisdom that is light. Don't let men deceive you. After the traditions of men. After the traditions of men. After the traditions of men. And guys, we actually have this on both sides of the aisle. We have this in the Christian church. And guys, even in the Messianic movement, we have men teaching Kabbalah and not Moses. You say, well, isn't that Jewish too? Every Satanist on the planet is thoroughly versed in Kabbalah. Because all it is is Babylonian mysticism with a, with a Jewish veneer on it. And you can actually lead it back to a rabbi that rejected Jesus and said Simon Bar Kochba was the Messiah. It was what, was, what was his name, Michael? Rabbi, starts with an A. Akiba, I want to say. It, it's, I don't have it. When, when I depart from my notes <laughs> and trying to do from memory. Um, but they have actually traced back the origin of Kabbalah to him. That he rejected Messiah and he opened himself up to something else. Stick with Moses. Stick with the writings and the prophets. Stick with the testimony of Messiah in the epistles. They are all in total agreement with one another. Everything from Genesis to Revelation is in balance, in agreement. There is no contradicting Moses in the New Testament. It's explaining what he meant and how we can walk in it. Don't let men deceive you with philosophy 
and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Messiah. I'm going to end it with this. And, and th there are some good people still on Christian television, even though they're not maybe teaching the ways of God. They're, they're, they're trying their best in the light of what they know. They're trying to stay true. Come on, they, they are. They're still preaching holiness. They, sometimes they preach it without necessarily preaching Moses, but when you take apart the components, they're still, in a sense, preaching Moses in the midst of it. But at the same time, Christian television was originally established to bring the world to Christ. And what it has done now, a good portion of it, is actually taking the church away from Christ. Micah gave good insights Wednesday night that he, he said that most men that, that don't, don't understand our Hebraic heritage, there is an underlining anger in them. Because men that said they were representing Jesus said, here's how to cure all your problems. Write a check and send it to P.O. Box. You know how you can cure all your problems? Repent if my people who are called by name, my name will humble themselves, repent of their wicked ways, and shuban and to turn back to my ways. I'll come and I'll heal their land. And sometime your land may just be nothing more than the, the small house that you have. But the way out of your trouble is the way of God. Because if you, if you quit doing the things that blow up your house and start doing the things that build up your house, you'll eventually get with a house that is built up. And men right now are angry because they were presented another Jesus and it doesn't work. They're frustrated. And when you separate, this is one of the things that got me excited about Hebraic heritage. It gives men their place back in the church. Because the way that we do it in a traditional church, I am the highest authority. In this congregation, men, over your household, you are the highest authority. You've got to hear and you've got to do. My job is to ensure that you have the tools that you need to move in what you do. We have emasculated the male in traditional church, and, we have, and men are doers. I liked what Dwight Pryor said years ago in teaching on relationship. Men sometimes struggle with relationships. Only women are human beings. But that's probably not news to any woman. Men are human doings. God put him in the garden and said work. He put Eve in the garden to have relationship with the worker. You take away the commandments from men, they have nothing to do. You have emasculated them. And, all it, and it, it causes helplessness in the male. And so then we have all these churches, women are just, and it, it seems like women are doing everything because they're, 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 they, they're, they network, they relation, and men are frustrated. I got nothing to do. I got nothing to do. No, you got everything to do. Because when you're busy doing the word, it frees up the woman to have the relationships the way that she needs. When men's Shoulders are wide because they're to carry the load of the doing. Come on now. And when men take up the... And see, that, that's part of, of, of where we're headed. I'm, I'm going to end with this. I'm, I'm already far beyond my notes. Part of what God's getting ready to do, because good men weren't doing the right thing, evil was allowed to flourish in this nation. Just like when good men in Israel didn't do the right thing, evil flourished. But let me tell you something. It's time for good men to pick up the fight again. And you fight by doing what's right and taking a stand for the good and saying, as far as me and my house, we're serving God. And woman, you better get in line with what I see in the Word. And that frees up the woman and say, go, boy, go. I'm behind you. Because the harder you stand, the easier it is for me to stand. Women right now are tired because they have had to fulfill a lot of the places that men in our traditions told them they couldn't fill. And the women are tired. The women are tired of making all the decisions. The women are tired of having to take up the spiritual authority all the time when the men should be doing it. Then they could just simply say, you know what? The Bible says if two or more are coming to agreement, now I can agree with you. So now <laughs> we're coming into agreement and the kingdom of God could come here. We need to quit living life 
off of what we created, a Christian version of Hollywood. We need to go back to the Word of God. And, and even as we do this, guys, you know, I don't wear a, a towel lead every service. You know why? Because to most of the people that I'm trying to reach, that's a foreign thing. And I'm also, as you guys learn this, I don't want any one of you walking out of here with a towel lead on and do something stupid and, a, and the Jewish community is blamed for it. Okay? It's for your prayer closet. But it's doing. It's doing. Be a doer of a word and not a hearer only, deceiving yourselves. The church is deceived and the devil didn't do it. We gave him a holiday. He just said, you're stuck on stupid. That's just the perfect place for you to be. Makes it real easy for me. God is setting before us and it's going to be so crucial in the days ahead. Do the commandments because you love Jesus. Because you love the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And right now the whole world is beginning to follow after what they believe is the God of Abraham, Ishmael, and Muhammad. Liberals, progressives, all, socialism all following after it. Because the Illuminati are trying to bring about the king of despots. That's the Antichrist if you don't know that. Because he's going to finally, in their thinking, he's going to take them back to Genesis 3 where he says, I'm going to teach you how to become gods. There is no God but the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he is Yahweh Elohim. And he stands in the heavens and he balances grace and justice in this creation. All creation is answerable to him. How he said to live, who he said Messiah was, and the path that he set before us. Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you that by the finished work of Jesus, our Messiah, that we are a people that are called by your name. And Father, we humble ourselves this morning. We, we say that the church is off course. It has replaced your ways with the ways of Babylon. And the prophets of Baal are flourishing more than the prophets of Almighty God. And we have even funded it because we thought it was the quick way to the blessing, the easy way, the wide path. But Father, this morning we see the error of our ways and we choose to follow Jesus into that narrow gate, into that narrow path that leads to Mount Zion, that leads to the city of our God. And Father, we choose this morning to embrace your commandments, statutes, and judgments because we love Jesus, because he is almighty God come in the flesh and gave his life for us. Lord, I just loosen anointing this morning. Let it, Father, let it begin to flow from this place that would show a dying world the true Jesus and would show a dying church the true Jesus. That we could repent and cut off the things of Babylon, cut off the things of Egypt and of Rome and follow the true Jesus of the Bible. Because only through the true Jesus of the Bible can we follow the true God of the Bible the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We rejoice in him. We rejoice in his commandments. We rejoice in your word, Father. And we know that as we do, that we're going to be strengthened. And Father, this morning to those, the remnant that have been trying to follow your ways, and it seems like we're like trout follow, trying to swim upstream, and Father, it seems like a never-ending battle. Father, this morning in the name of Messiah, I say be strong, be strong, and be strengthened. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might so that we can stand in that evil day. That our conscience 
will be standing with us because we know that in the situations of life that we have done the right thing, that we have planted the right seed, that we have done the right deeds to honor and to bring glory to the name of Jesus. And because of that, we are going to see his glory. We are going to see his blessing in the midst of the storm. And it will be a testimony to the supremacy of who Jesus really is. Father, we thank you and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name.